Um, this has been a wonderful series. We've had uh, Brent Scowcroft, Tara Sonnenschein, Ambassador Thomas Pickering, uh, and uh, it's been an excellent series to honor uh, Walter Roberts, who uh, sadly passed away this spring uh, at the age of 97. Uh, he was uh, a great diplomat and uh, had a lifetime of service to his adopted country, one of the original VOA broadcasters, uh, served as the PAO in Belgrade, worked under uh, George Kennan. Uh, he would tell amazing stories, by the way, uh, about George Kennan um, that were fascinating, especially when the big Kennan book came out. Um, he had his own version of, of those events uh, that were interesting to hear. Um, so, sadly, this is the first Walter Roberts Memorial uh, lecture, but uh, Robert uh, Ford, Ambassador Ford, was somebody that Walter had spoken about as a possible speaker for this series since we started it. Uh, and I know in the last, the last time that I had lunch with Walter, and we talked about uh, what this, this year's speaker uh, might be, what that profile might be, he uh, mentioned Ambassador Ford uh, quite prominently. And one of the things I think is excellent about, of all years, having Ambassador Ford speak at the first memorial uh, lecture is that Walter, as those of you who knew him know, uh, was to the end a uh, great thinker about public diplomacy and a very innovative thinker about public diplomacy. Uh, and uh, he, one of the things that he really liked about having Ambassador Ford give this lecture, uh, potentially, was that he saw in Ambassador Ford another person who had been very creative uh, and very innovative in diplomacy and public diplomacy, and Walter was one of those people uh, who increasingly felt that there wasn't really a division between the two and that Ambassador Ford really represented the new kind of public diplomacy um, and the new kind of diplomacy. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Ambassador Ford, who will be joined after his opening remarks uh, by our own uh, Frank Cessna, who's the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs, Emmy Award-winning journalist, former White House correspondent, and a great boss uh, to work with. <laughs> He controls my raise, which I haven't gotten yet, so that's why I have to say this. Um, uh, ambassador Ford served as the U.S. Ambassador to Syria from 2010 to 2014. Since joining the U.S. Foreign Service in 1985, he's been posted throughout the Middle East and Africa in Turkey, Egypt, Algeria, and Cameroon. Um, he is currently the senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C., and Ambassador Ford uh, is going to give us a lively talk tonight, but he has to catch a train afterwards, so we're going to stick rigidly to our time schedule and uh, so that he can fly out of here and get home. Thank you. Without further ado, Ambassador Ford. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sean, for that kind introduction. And it's really a delight to be here. And I see a couple of people here that I'd like to just say it's great to see you um, and that it's fun to work with you. I see Jim Bullock, with whom I served in, in Iraq when we were getting shelled, and I see Amir Faizi, um, who I have to say, um, Amir's not going to tell you, so I will. Um, Amir worked with us a lot in Baghdad in 2004 and 5 um, when we were trying to get an understanding of what the Jaysh al-Mahdi was, and Amir was going down to parts of Baghdad and risking his life to help us understand that. And Amir, it's great to see you safe, and it's great to see you in America. So um, I'm going to just talk about some of my own experiences working as a, as a diplomat over 30 years. And I'm going to tell a few stories. Um, and then I look forward to um, talking to Frank um, and then talking to the audience as well. Um, but I'm going to tell you about five lessons that I've learned um, during a diplomatic career about public uh, diplomacy. And the first thing I have to say is it is surprising how little training they give you when you start at the State Department about, uh, well, training in general and public diplomacy in particular. Um, but training in general is pretty lacking. For example, um, no one ever explained to me how to set a table with separate glasses for red and white wine or sparkling wines. I had no idea. Uh, no one explained to me the difference between calling someone your excellency or your highness or your beatitude. Um, and it's obvious no one explained anything about how to dress for success. Um, and really, there was very little explanation about how to work with the media and how to reach out to the public. 
And so the five lessons I share with you now are just my thoughts looking back. Uh, the first is it's really important at specific times to be seen. Uh, being there physically matters and it especially matters when you're an ambassador. Um, when I was in Syria in 2011 and the Syrian uprising was gaining steam, I visited the city of Hama. And I did not go there to support the protesters. A lot of media has said, well, he went there to show support for the protesters. That's actually not correct. Their political demands were not really our business, properly speaking. It was between them and the the Syrian government. What I went there for was to show American support for those protesters' right to assemble and demonstrate peacefully, not in support of their demands, but their right to present the demands. That's in the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It's Article 20, which Syria itself signed on to in 1948. Um, I should also add that our execution of demonstrating that didn't work perfectly. Uh, we got in a car, me and the defense attache. Um, we knew that the protests were generally peaceful because I had sent people up to Hama a few days before. And so then I thought I needed to go myself. And the reason is uh, there were stories in the press that the Syrian army was assembling outside of Hama. In 1982, Bashar al-Assad's father attacked Hama when they had problems there and killed 30,000 people. So given that unhappy history, I thought, I need to go myself. And if there is violence, whether from the regime side or from the protesters' side, I will be an eyewitness. The American ambassador will be an eyewitness, and we will tell the world who started it. Um, but if they are peaceful, protests, then they have the right to demonstrate, assemble peacefully. Um, by the way, the French ambassador had exactly the same conclusion. Um, so we drove up there. I'll just tell you the story. And we made it. We went through several Syrian army checkpoints. And they waved us through. And I was surprised, actually. I thought they'd turn us back. Um, and we got all the way into the city. And things were closed. And we were surrounded by a group of young men. And my bodyguard went nuts. Um, because we, the car was surrounded by about 25 guys, young men. Um, we didn't see any weapons, and they s made us stop the car. They surrounded the car. And they said in Arabic, who are you? And we said, uh, we're diplomats. Uh, we came to see what's going on. They were, oh, diplomats, wonderful. Please go through. And I was stunned because Syria was a rigid police state. I mean, think about Joe Stalin in the KGB or Brezhnev in the KGB. I and mean, that's the kind of place Syria was. Um, and I literally, I remember driving away and looking back at them and saying, did you see that? There was like no police. These guys are controlling the street. We didn't go two minutes, and we were surrounded again by another group. Same story. This time, we rolled down the window about this much. And they said, who are you? And we said, we're American diplomats. We came to see what's going on. Oh, American diplomats, please go through. Alhan wa you are welcome. So... Uh, we're like, wow, look at this. The Syrian government is not in control of what's going on down here. But did you see any weapons? I didn't see any weapons. Did you see any weapons? We, stopped, we were stopped at the third checkpoint, about again, about 200 meters down the road. This time, I asked uh, the defense attache, because we were far enough in the city, I said, well, we better check the map and figure out where the protests are, the main square. Check the map. And he looked at me, and he said, I thought you were bringing the map. And I said, I'm the ambassador. I don't do anything useful. That's your job. And he didn't bring the map. And we asked his driver, the staff sergeant Cressetti. He didn't bring the map. He thought the bodyguard was bringing the map. Bodyguard thought Sergeant Cressetti was bringing it. We had no map. It was a big city. None of us had been there. There's no GPS in Syria. It's not allowed. So at this third place where we were stopped and surrounded, I got out of the car. And bodyguards, don't get out of the car. I'm like, who else speaks Arabic in this car? got out of the car, and I said, how do we get to Asif Square downtown? It's like, oh, you go down here a couple of blocks, turn left, turn right. I was totally lost. I said, perhaps someone could take us. And Allah moves in mysterious ways in the Middle East. Out of nowhere, a white pickup pulls up. And the guys at this 
opposition checkpoint said, hey, Abu Mohammed, would you take the American diplomats downtown to the square? He's like, sure, follow me. We go winding through. He waves at everybody at the checkpoint. They all know him. He's like, yeah, the diplomat, foreigner guys are with us. There's, so now we understand there's like multiple checkpoints. Here is not in control. There's an organization. That, you know, he knows people and they know him. Um, we get downtown. The demonstration's not supposed to start for a little while. And so we pull up and we're going to stay the night in a hotel and the hotel is closed. Why is the hotel closed? There's a general strike. We didn't know. Um, and there was no world media in Hama. Nobody could know. So we're sort of standing there stupidly and there were these three Syrian gentlemen in dish dashes drinking tea in the shade of a tree in white plastic chairs. You see them everywhere in the Middle East. And they're looking at us. We're looking at them. And they said, oh, so you don't have a place to stay. And we said, no, we don't. Uh, we're going to have to find one. And they said, everything is closed. You won't find anything. You want some tea? We didn't know anybody that it was safe to call. Anybody, you know, the secret police monitor the phones. So um, I said, sure, we'll have tea. So out of nowhere, four more plastic chairs, tea comes. They're looking at us, and we're looking at them. And the guy looks at me and says, well, who are you? And I said, well, I'm the American ambassador. We came to see what's going on. And they're like, nah, 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 you're not the ambassador. Who are you? And I said, no, no, really, I'm the American ambassador. But I didn't look like Harrison Ford. I didn't look like Brad Pitt. I mean, I was quite disappointing. <laughs> I pulled out cards and passed them out. And when they saw the Arabic, they immediately reached in all three of them, reached in and immediately tell them, come down here right now. The American ambassador is here. Within, I'm not kidding, three to five minutes, we had a crowd of 30 to 40 people um, all talking at us. I wished I'd had a tape recorder. It's one of my big regrets. Um, about the suffering they had experienced at the hands of the regime during the previous 20 years. Um, someone's brother was arrested and disappeared. They never saw him again. Someone was fired from a job because of politics. Uh, someone wasn't hired because of politics. Someone lost their apartment. Someone's fam uh, family farm was expropriated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It didn't matter what we thought. Nobody said, so, Robert, what's the American government position on you know, the upright? No, they just wanted to, to talk. They wanted to enunciate. So after that, they then took us to the demonstration. But again, we got kind of lost. Um, we got separated. <coughs> we didn't have a map. And we bumbled into the demonstration. You just, videos of people surrounding the car. My bodyguard almost had a heart attack um, because they were really big crowds, thousands of people, um, who put olive branches on a car. It was already out that we were there. Um, and it made the international media within 30 minutes. I had a phone call. Um, cell phone was amazing. The BBC was calling, are you in Hama? Um, what that visit did was really two things. First, it showed that we were paying attention, and it really made the government angry. In fact, they attacked the embassy three days later. But the fact that the French and the American ambassadors were there and saw personally that those were peaceful protests infuriated the regime. It really put them in a box, because we were eyewitnesses. <laughs> um, the second thing it did was it showed the Syrian public that we were paying attention to their demands. I think, frankly, in retrospect, our message of nonviolence was lost in the overall glow that we had gone to demonstrate support for their human rights. And that probably is unfortunate, although I think the, the Civil War would have become violent in any case. But the fact that we went personally, and especially someone of the rank of an ambassador, made a huge difference. So being there is important. Lesson number two, really important to reach out to regular people. Another story from Syria. Um, early in the uprising, after Assad had called out security forces to confront peaceful protesters, there was a very brave young man named Riyath Matar, who was counseling people in his neighborhood outside of Damascus, in the Damascus suburbs, not to fight the police, and instead to collect flowers and put them in the barrels of the guns of the army soldiers facing him. Um, which they did, and actually 
That caused the first couple of defections from the Syrian army. The regime was furious. They picked Riyadh up and they tortured him to death. Um, his bruised and beaten body was returned to the family. When I heard about that, we sent a message to the family through an intermediary saying, Riyadh's death and his message of peace, we totally support. And his death is tragic. And if you, the family, think it would be helpful, we would be happy to attend the funeral, but we don't want to put you in a bad position. So if you think it's too dangerous, we certainly understand. But if you think it would be useful to have international presence, we will come. The message came back from that incredibly brave family. Riyadh would like the international recognition of what he was trying to do. Um, so I called um, friends among the ambassador corps in Damascus. And we actually got eight ambassadors to attend, including the Japanese ambassador, the European Union, French, German, British, and others. That was the top news story that night on satellite Arabic TV stations. Someone in the funeral ceremony must have had um, a cell phone with a camera. So many Syrians do. And it was all over the, the internet. I can't tell you how many Syrians came up to us later and said, you, you know, going to Riyadh's funeral meant a lot to them. I still get even here in the United States. I have Syrians who come up to me and mention that. Um, and that family is incredibly brave. After we left, the secret police swooped in and arrested a bunch of their family. And that district now is almost leveled by people who've been there recently told me the fighting has been so severe there that almost no building is standing. Um, I think reaching out to regular people is very much what Chris Stevens, an ambassador colleague of mine who died in Libya, Chris also strongly, strongly believed in that. Um, but in order to do that work, in order to make those contacts, and in order to get out, be seen, and to reach out, we have to be able to get out of our buildings. We have to have our security officers willing to take a risk occasionally now and then, not stupid risks, uh, but just sitting inside the walls is not helpful. Um, I think a lot about colleagues that are in Iraq now, and I hope the security is not preventing them from getting out and doing the political and diplomatic work they need to do in order to reinforce the efforts of our troops that are trying to assemble Iraqi forces to fight the Islamic State. Um, lesson number three, got to keep up with the technology. Um, for a long time, we thought, well, if you get yourself in the newspaper or on TV, that's enough. Um, but in fact, it's not enough. And after I visited Hama, I told you the story, uh, the Syrian government absolutely did not want me on television. So they refused any access to any kind of Syrian media. There was no independent Syrian media, obviously. Um, and we didn't really want to chase the Arabic satellite media, uh, most of whom didn't even have reporters in Syria uh, as the uprising became more serious and violence started to break out. And so um, one of the things we started doing was putting up postings on Facebook um, from me personally. I would write them. Um, and they would get picked up almost immediately by Arabic media. I don't know how they got it so fast, but they did. Um, so we noticed that if we put something on Facebook by 3 in the afternoon, it would be on the 8 o'clock main TV news for El Arabiya and El Jazeera. And so we could actually reach Syrians very easily, even if they didn't have internet access, and many didn't, uh, but they all watched satellite TV, so we could get picked up right that way. Um, and there was nothing the Syrian government could do about it because they didn't control our access to Facebook. So. When I had to close the embassy in February 2012 to come back for uh, security reasons, um, the Syrian government had started to shell uh, cities with artillery. But they denied it. They said, oh, that's not us. We're not doing that. Um, we at the State Department actually were looking at satellite photos of the artillery and where it was placed and how it was pointed right at Homs and other cities and blasting away. So I went to the secretary. Um, Hillary Clinton, and I said, we really need to get these in the public domain. I said, if we put them on Facebook, we'll get it all over the Arab world real quick. And I told her what I just told you about the, the Facebook. And she agreed right away. She was totally with it. So for the first time ever, we put satellite photos on US embassy postings to show what the regime was actually doing. And it shut 
the Russians up, who were saying, oh, there's no artillery, and it shut the regime up. The regime stopped denying that it was using artillery. Now, it didn't lead to a settlement of the Syrian uprising, um, but it did, again, say that we have ways of explaining what the regime is doing, personal presence, satellite photos. Um, we're watching. Lesson number four, don't overuse your access to the media. Um, best lesson I can, best way I can explain this here is when I was ambassador in Algeria, the Algerian government certainly is not as awful and repressive as the Syrian government, but it is, it is a strong police state. It's very authoritarian. We were trying little by little to get them to open up. They agreed to a program with their parliament that the National Democratic Institute wanted to do. Uh, they agreed to do some rule of law programming with us so we could do uh, training of investigators and judges. Um, and they actually were real anxious for more uh, bilateral cooperation in the field of education, things like English teaching and um, long distance learning in English in um, subjects that their students could benefit from and find jobs, things like engineering and nursing. Um, in Algeria, I knew lots of Algerian journalists. It um, was on first name basis with dozens of them. And it was very easy for me to get in the press. They needed to sell copy. Um, and there was a sort of a mentality um, that a lot of us in the State Department had that the more you could get in the media and in the public diplomacy domain, the better. But that's not always true. I found with time that my high media profile was actually frightening the Algerian government, which is a little cautious and was nervous itself of criticism from Algerians and worried that I'd speak out publicly in criticism of the Algerian government. Um, my being too high profile in the media actually frightened them uh, because they were afraid that I would, in a sense, um, take up opposition causes that would put them at a disadvantage. And I should have toned it down a bit, looking back. Uh, so don't overuse your access. Think about the audience and measure the amount of uh, coverage you want to use. Finally, my last story, also from Algeria, is the, the broad power of the field of outreach, public diplomacy, and soft power, um, what Joseph Nye spoke about so admirably. Um, when I was in Algeria, I visited in 2007 the University of Tlemcen, which is out on the far western end of Algeria, not so far from the Moroccan border. I served in Algeria during the worst of their civil war in the mid-1990s when the government was confronting a really horrible Islamist extremist opposition and over 150,000 people died. Not that you would know it because so few journalists went to Algeria during those terrible times. And Tlemcen was a real hotbed of that extremism. Uh, much quieter when I went back as ambassador in 2007 and we had uh, some education cooperation programs and I think I mentioned education and long distance learning and we had some at the University of Tlemcen and I wanted to see them. But I was very reluctant to go to a university in a high profile kind of way, the American ambassador, you almost certainly are gonna trigger anti-American protests at a university in an Arab country, and especially in a place like Tlemcen, which has such a conservative Islamist tinge to it. So I told the public affairs officer, second tour officer, Amanda Johnson, she's terrific, said, Amanda, we want to keep this low profile. Just go in. We're going to look at the English language courses that we support, and maybe we'll look at one of these long-distance learning programs, and then we're out. No media, no big speeches, just in and out. Yes, sir. So. Purely by coincidence, the day that we were going uh, out to Tlemcen, the Israelis bombed Gaza. So something had happened triggering an Israeli stern response, and the Israelis heavily bombed Gaza that day. So I reminded Amanda, you know, this is the last day in the world. We need to make a big splash at the university. We'll for sure trigger reactions from students who are unhappy about the Palestinians getting bombed in Gaza. Yes, sir, she got it. So we drive up to the university, and there's this huge reception line. 30 people looked at him and Amanda. And we got out of the car. The president of the university is right there. Oh, Mr. President, wonderful. This is the vice president. This is the vice president. This is the dean of the dean. Cameras. <laughs> looked at Amanda. Amanda. 
university president pulls me in and I said, well, I'm so looking forward to seeing the English class. Um, I understand there are about 20 students, Mr. President. He said, oh, no, 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 we've had to move it. I said, I beg your pardon? He said, no, we've had to move it. There are so many students that want to see you. We've had to put it in the biggest hall at the university. There are over 500 in its standing room only. I'm like, I, I, I almost killed Amanda with my look. <laughs> so we go in. And I'm expecting, really, I mean, it was like, I felt like Anne Boleyn going to the block at the tower. I just knew we were going to get cream. And uh, they, when I went in, um, even though I don't look like Brad Pitt or Harrison Ford, I, much to my surprise, they stood and applauded. All these Algerian students stood and applauded. And I'm literally, I was like this, <laughs> like waiting for the other shoe to drop. And after about... 15 seconds, I turned to the university president and I said, why are they applauding? I said, this is not what I expect as an American ambassador. And he said, but you don't understand about your programs. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, every student who has graduated out of the long distance program in engineering and every student who has graduated out of the long distance program in nursing found a job. Every single one. This is in a country with youth unemployment at 50%. They put on their applications that they studied with Americans, engineering or nursing, and that they speak fluent English. And everyone got hired. And he said, now, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, I have a two-year waiting list to get into our English language training programs. I have a two-year waiting list to get into these nursing and engineering programs. And we need you to do much more of this. I turned to Amanda and I said, good job, Amanda. <laughs> I then. A couple of months later, came back. This is in 2007. We had a meeting of all of the Near East Affairs Bureau ambassadors, Arab world. And Condi Rice came and talked to us about Iran this and peace processes and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and at the end of it, I raised my hand and I said, Madam Secretary, I said, and I told the story I just told you, but much more condensed. And I said, those programs cost about $750,000, and we're spending $750 million a day in Iraq. Could we please just get a few million dollars more for some of these long-distance programs? I'd put one in eastern, uh, eastern Algeria, like Constantine. She kind of looked at me and was kind of saying, oh, Robert, yes, that's such a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, although I don't, I, she just wasn't in a position to make any commitments, thankfully, Karen Hughes at the time, uh, the undersecretary for public affairs at the department, um, did come to Algeria. And we showed her what we saw. And we did set up a program like that in Constantine University. We found American universities that are willing to hook up. And so we have it now in both eastern and western Algeria, important country. And I don't think it even cost half a million dollars more. Money incredibly well spent, less than a cruise missile. And so um, as we think about how to confront the Islamic State, and as we think about what to do about this extremism problem and young people who are signing up to fight for <coughs> awful groups like the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda in places like Syria and Iraq, I hope we don't forget the importance <coughs> and the power of soft <coughs> diplomacy, soft power. Thank you very much. You've been a very patient audience as I go through these stories. Thanks. <laughs> Does that work? Well, first of all, thank you very much for being here on behalf of the George Washington University and the School of Media and Public Affairs and the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communication. Your five lessons are riveting and relevant, and your stories are amazing. Um, before we start, I would like to just, in honor of, of Walter, Thank you for being here. And for those of you who knew Walter and knew what he stood for and knew what he cared about and how he believed in the message and the truth and the story and that power, I think this is a wonderful way to honor uh, his name and his legacy. Thank so you. I know this would be meaningful to him. Um, I am really interested in this. You know, I covered um, the White House, as, as, as Sean pointed out. And George Herbert Walker Bush was very fond of saying 90% of life is just showing up. And what you say about showing up as an ambassador is 
very powerful. Could you go to Hama today after Benghazi? Uh, it would be really hard. I think um, colleagues in the field are having a harder time getting out. Is your mic on? Are you able to hear him in the back? Should I move? Should I move this? Try up? that. There you go. Yeah. Um, I think colleagues in the field are having a harder time getting out and about. The one of the things the political hullabaloo in Washington, um, especially up on Capitol Hill. Um, has led the State Department to be much more conservative and less willing to accept risks. And, you know, if you want perfect safety, I have to tell you, don't go overseas, stay home. Um, there's always an element, and especially when you're working in a place where there's a lot of tension, but that's actually where diplomacy is needed most. Uh, and so there has to be a willingness to accept some level of risk. I'm not saying be stupid about it. Um, when but some we, might say you were stupid to get in a car with no map and go to. <laughs> well, we all thought the other one brought the map. That's, <laughs> that's a problem of execution. Um, but what I did know was that if we went up there, um, the people would be happy we went because they were confronting a terrible regime and they wanted international support. <laughs> So although my bodyguard was very nervous when the car got surrounded, I never felt threatened in the slightest. And in fact, when we said we're American diplomats, they said, oh, American diplomats, go right through. Um, well, you, I, it wasn't a surprise. So, so, so you pointed out that there's so, you know, that you weren't trained on which wine glass to use. Yeah, yeah. Had Presumably, no were you trained on how to be in very dangerous situations like Not this? Not even a little. OK, so if you were doing that training today, against the backdrop of the reality of the world, especially that part of the world as we know it, what would you be training young foreign service, young public diplomacy uh, uh, experts and, and practitioners to be doing? Several things. First, um, get specific about the threats, Frank. Um, it's not enough to say it's dangerous out there. Um, is it dangerous everywhere? Or is it just dangerous here and here, but if you go here, it's not so bad? Um, second, what are the, what are the warning signs? Of what, are, what are your contacts telling you? Our contacts were telling us, if you go to Hama, the people will be happy to see you. I mean, we had sent people up before, and they came back saying the same thing. Um, Amir is sitting here. He and I worked very closely together when I was in the political office in Baghdad. Um, we would depend on people like Amir to say, Watch out about this. This might be OK. Be careful over there. You don't just take one person's word for it. You triangulate. Um, but there are ways to manage risk. Did you do that before you went up to Hama? Yes. So how did you assess that? How did you know precisely where you wanted to go, where the risk was and where the risk wasn't? Or did you? Yeah. No, we knew that the road going up would be safe. There had been no fighting along the road. We knew from multiple contacts that the demonstrations so far had been peaceful. And I mean big demonstrations, Frank. I mean, we're talking about 100 to 200,000 people. Huge demonstration. Um, but we knew from Syrian Americans who had been there that they were peaceful. And then I sent up a young, uh, fluent Arabic-speaking diplomat to go talk to people there. She came back and said, oh, it's festive. She said, it's not violent at all. That was the word she used, uh, what, what was your? So, but then we heard that the Syrian army was massing, and what we did not want was for them to go in, violence to break out, and then the government says, no, the protest movement started it, and the protest movement says the regime started it, and I'm going to be asked by the secretary, by the Congress, by the media, Mr. Ambassador, who started this? And I'm going to say, well, I don't know. I was sitting back in Damascus. <coughs> It was One much of, better for my own credibility with my own audiences yeah. back here for me to be able to say I was there personally. Clearly this that's, personally clearly that's desirable. But one of the, so one of the things that came out of Benghazi, the tragedy in Benghazi with Chris Stevens, is the time it took from the time they got into trouble till anybody could get there and do anything about it. So what was your backup plan? What if you had gotten in trouble? out there. What, did you have a backup plan? Did you have anybody? No, we would have, we would have. You had, would have been in trouble. Yeah, we would have been in trouble. So how was, where did you end up spending the night? Um, we did find a hotel across the river. <laughs> how was, the tea was good. Um, 
I, I'm interested, too, in your um, discussion about um, reaching out to regular people. Uh, and in some ways, the example you gave, he actually wasn't a regular person. He was someone who was martyred for, for this process. On a daily basis, who are the regular people that, in your five lessons, you most recommend mm -hmm. the people in the room who want to do this for a living are reaching out to? Mm -hmm. Can they do that easily? When I was a young diplomat in Cairo, I used to love to go down to the different markets in the city. Um, for example, there's a Muslim holiday called Eid al-Adha, where families will buy a sheep and take it home and slaughter it, and they eat some of it, and they give some of it, the meat, to the poor. So I used to love to go down to the markets a week or two before and talk to the guys selling sheep. How are sheep prices? I was in the economic section. We were trying to get a gauge of how Egyptians were coping with economic reform and economic liberalization. I used to talk to the sheep sellers. How's, how are sheep sales doing? How are prices? How are moving up? Business good this year? It was a way of measuring. Right how Egyptians are doing. Um, I used to go to cafes um, and smoke uh, water pipes and trade jokes with Egyptians. And at first they'd be like, who are you? And I'd say, well, I'm, you know, I work at the American Embassy. But I studied Arabic here when I was a student. And I, you know, have you heard this joke? And I'd tell them one. And then I'd get six in return. That gives you, again, a sense of how people are doing. Could you do that today? In Egypt? Would you do that today in Egypt? I think I would in some places, yeah. There might be some places I wouldn't do it, but there are some places I would. I mean, this is actually an area where... But, where Frank, if I was a woman, I'd be more careful. Yeah. Because of the way women have been treated, even in downtown Cairo. <laughs> but I think for a man, it's one thing. For a woman, it's not. This makes it but harder for women and... and for, but for it does. But this is what I'm talking about. Identify the risks specifically and then figure out what you can do to counteract the risks. I mean, this is something actually that, that, that diplomacy and journalism now share, right? Because yeah. you can't be a good reporter if you're not out That's on the right. street. You've got to be talking to what... But as we have seen, horrifically, Journalists have now become targets, yeah. and, and and diplomats have become yeah. more targets. So yeah, it's yeah. that's is that the biggest challenge? Do you think to being on the ground in country now, the the issue of being able to move beyond those walls and to move freely amongst different segments of the population, so that you're getting a really sort of a 360 on the place. I think it is the biggest. I was the reason I was thinking hard was because sometimes it's just very hard to get your message across, even if you're able to get out. But what I also think, my own experience is, if you are patient and you let people talk first, you don't insist on being only on transmit, but you're also on receive mode, which is important. Um, I think people will eventually give you a hearing too. At least that was my experience in the Middle East. The, the angriest meeting I was ever in was I went to um, a big family salon with probably 70, 80 people hosted at the home of a prominent Bahraini businessman the night before we started bombing in Iraq in 2003. <laughs> and everybody knew it was coming. I mean, there was no question. It was just, you know, one matter question. of time, right? And I thought it would be important again to go out and be seen and and hear, listen. And I had been to this salon several times before. The um, I called the the uh, the businessman and I said, I'd like to come tonight, but I don't want to put you in a bad position. So if you'd rather I not come, I'll stay home. And he said, No, no. I think Robert actually it's a good idea if you come. That's a good idea. So I parked the car and I went in. And it was one of these things where there's like this room full of people and they're all talking. And then I walk in and immediately it falls <laughs> silent and everybody's looking at me. I'm like, you know, this was a mistake. It's those clothes you're wearing again. Yeah, exactly. Not dressed for success. And then several people stood up and started screaming at their top of their lungs about how awful the Americans were and they're going to kill Muslims in Iraq. And I'm really very upset. And I sort of, I hesitated. I wasn't sure if I should go farther in the room or not. And the businessman said, Robert, come sit next to me. And he placed me on his right, and that was the end of it. It was the end of it, Frank, in terms of people shouting at the top of their lungs, cursing. But um, I was there from 9 in the morning, and 9 at night until 2 in the morning. 
the whole time thinking I will go out to my Toyota Corolla and the tires will be slashed. <laughs> um, and it wasn't. I cannot say at the end of that five hours, people left saying, wow, it's a good thing the Americans are going to take out Saddam Hussein. But they were not shouting. They had heard what I had to say. They had decided the Americans were not completely irrational, but only partly irrational. And they're at least willing to listen. And so, you know, we weren't going to win hearts and minds that night. That wasn't my intention. But my intention was to say, we are open to talking. To make a connection. Right. And that's an investment that you build on over time. Right. I, I want to ask the room a couple of questions and then come back to you. How many of you are in public diplomacy or have been in pub the line of public diplomacy professionally? How many of you as students and others are interested in it or would like to be in some kind of foreign service work, perhaps? Okay. How many of you have seen Charlie Wilson's War? Okay. Can you tell me why it's so difficult to get $750,000 to have more of those university I scenes? I, I mean, right? Soft power, those of you who've worked in it, it works. It is an investment. You build on it, right? I'm astonished that you're talking to Condi Rice. She knows better. The good news was Karen Hughes was sympathetic. Okay, right? but, she what, got on a plane but why, why it, are you, I don't mean you personally, but those of you who do this for a line of work, just not able to make the sale to the American public? Is it the political class here in Washington that's so stupid that they don't see that the investment is worth it? What is the problem here? Um, I think the biggest problem is that it's a lot easier to get money from, for cruise missiles in the budget process than it is to get money for educational exchange programs. But you've even had Bob Gates. I mean, you've had secretaries of defense and Panetta at least say yeah. that this should be done. But you know, I think here in Washington, a lot of it is not just making the case once, but making the case every day for a year or two. Is the problem that... And the I have, and with all due respect to Secretary Gates, great guy, um, really smart, but is he there pressing every day? No, that's not in his... And, and let's be honest, Frank, the State Department does not have a political constituency to back it up the way the Defense Department does. Right. That's always been a problem in the budget process. So what, how, would you, how could you change that? Well, I don't think you can easily. Um, but I think what you need to do, at least to help, is two things. One, um, that kind of example needs to be, and others examples like it, hopefully more and better, um, need to be put out in the public domain. And number two, we need, we, the diplomatic service as a profession, need to reach out to staffers, need to reach out to members of Congress when they're visiting us overseas, and really drive those kinds of stories home. And not say, you know, please fund, because we're not supposed to do that. But just make sure they understand what the stakes are. Robert Ford's lesson number three, keep up with technology. Yeah, always a challenge. I just got a smartphone, got off BlackBerry. Oh, we got we to gotta talk. Uh, <laughs> So we're the School of Media and Public Affairs. We deal with media all the time, information communication technologies, digital technologies, um, network advocacy, all of that kind of business. Back to the State Department and the training. You trained in social media? Are no. diplomats trained in social media? Not at all. I, I never was. Now, maybe the people coming in are. I don't know. I'm an old fart. So I don't, I mean, I don't is know. Is that a technical diplomatic? Yeah, a French, it's a French expression. It's a French fart. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know. I think a lot of people come in already fully mastering it. So the real challenge is getting the gray hairs to do it. So what on the ground did you find in these very difficult places uh, where you were was the most effective in terms of social media? Is it persuasion? Is it information? Is it Facebook? I mean, I'm, I'm talking at Two different levels here, obviously. One, sort of tactically, how are you connecting with people? And secondly, what are the platforms that you found were most effective? Embassy, well, your embassy was very active on the social media Yeah. Sphere. Well, I think um, we ended up getting thousands of um, followers on our Facebook page. Um, was that, and that, was that because you were doing things like posting satellite? I mean, you were, you were putting substance up there. Yeah. Right? Um, I mean, we put, uh, eventually, it ended up being both a place to put substantive information and then policy statements as well, right. which were less substantive. Uh, I, think it, I think it's a matter of sort of preference, Frank. I'm 
I'm someone who likes to plunge into the substance of an issue. So I do Twitter. I didn't do it when I was an ambassador. I didn't even know what it was. I mean, I tweet, twit, whatever it was. I just, <laughs> it was like too much. I thought I was quite advanced doing Facebook. Um, now I realize that I was already like half a generation behind. So, and I'm probably still a half a generation behind. So as I say, part of it is just getting people like me, and let's be honest, most ambassadors and deputy ambassadors are of a generation where we didn't learn Did this Did you have trouble school. clearing what you were posting? Were you, were you posting in English or Arabic? Both. Both. And did you have to clear all of that back home before you could post in the um, country? I, again, speaking very frankly, originally no. Um, we would just post it. As Syria became more and more of a political problem for the administration, more sensitive. then they started to want to clear stuff in advance because the politics back here in Washington were going against the administration. Did you ever get in trouble with their folks back home for what you were? No. They ever they say, ever reel you in for saying uh, too much? I have to say, the entire time I worked on Syria, I got great support from the people at the State Department. Secretary Clinton, Secretary Kerry, their staff. You know, when I went up to Hama, um, I just sent a little note that night to the Syria team back here in Washington and said, tomorrow I'm going up to Hama. I don't think any of them even began to understand what it meant or what it would do. And then it was all over the news. And, I want to I want to ask you a couple of questions about Hama, and then I'd like to ask you some quest questions more broadly about what's going on on the ground now in the region and elsewhere. And then we'll open it up to your questions on public diplomacy or anything you'd like to ask uh, of the ambassador. And the Hama trip was really remarkable, and coming just as Assad was really beginning the crackdown. Right? Yeah. What were your impressions? What when you left? What had really struck you the most? Several things that we didn't know until we went up. Uh, that there was a much bigger organization attached to the opposition. It wasn't just a protest movement, but there were organizers. We actually met some of them. Um, the organizers had um, the hospitals so that when people were injured in clashes with police, um, they could get people quickly to the hospitals. They were organizing charity drives um, so that families that um, had lost um, a husband or a brother or a breadwinner um, the police had arrested them. They could get food to the family. Um, they had these checkpoints. And I asked, you know, what's with these checkpoints? Why are you doing this? And they said, because the secret police try to come into the city at night and arrest people. And so what we have found is if we block the roads, you know, we let them through. We don't fight them, but we can telephone and say, you know, they're at checkpoint 22 headed towards checkpoint 32. So there was a level of organization that we had no idea existed. Um, what we then discovered as we went to other cities was that the one in Jassim, south of Damascus, was not connected in any way to the one in Hama. Everything was local. Um, very flat and very local. And what that meant was that there was really no way you could arrest two or three people and shut it down. Mm. That's why the government, even now, hasn't really been able to put down the uprising, because it's very flat. But what that also means is because it's very flat and it has no leadership, it doesn't really have an identified set of political demands. Everybody is free to speak what they think. And it becomes a cacophony rather than an organized political force. When you step down from your position, and since, you've been critical of the Obama administration. <coughs> and I was looking back at some of the comments you've made. And you did an interview with CNN, my friend Christian Amanpour, in June. And you said, I was no longer in a position where I felt I could defend American policy. We've been unable to address the root causes of the conflict in terms of the fighting on the ground and the balance on the ground. And we have a growing extremism threat. You said, there is really nothing we can point to that's been successful in our policy except the renew removal of about 93% of some of Assad's chemical materials. Mm -hmm. Policy's changed a little bit. When We're was that, Frank? June. Uh, that was before the Islamic State took Mosul. Right. Yeah. So do you want to revise and amend your comments? No, I, I stand by them. Absolutely. What's the problem? You know, What's the, the, problem? the policy was, and it, was, it was a policy based on hope rather than hard-headed, tough ideas. U.S. policy was based yeah. on hope. We wanted a political negotiation to set up a national unity government that would be able to create a ceasefire between Assad and the moderate armed opposition and then they could both turn together, arm in arm, and fight 
the Islamic State and the Nusra Front. That's what we wanted. Great idea. And frankly, that's kind of what the administration is trying to do in Iraq right now. Um, but there was no way to make that happen, no way to have a serious negotiation, unless the Assad regime felt a need to negotiate seriously. And without military pressure, it's a very tough, hard regime. Without genuine military pressure on it, so that they have something to lose if they walk away from the negotiations, they weren't going to negotiate. Why, why not? That's more, what I meant about change the balance on the ground. Why not more resolve from this administration, do you think? What's your interpretation? I think, I, let me share a story. I live up in Baltimore, and um, I was asked to give a talk at uh, the church I attend about the situation in Syria. This is maybe seven, eight months ago. And um, so at the start of the talk, there were about 40, 45 church members there, um, Episcopalians, so they're not particularly theological or ideological, and um, uh, they don't even really know what they believe. Um, <laughs> so it's great to be an Episcopalian. So um, <laughs> I asked them, how many of you want to send American military forces into Syria? Zero. You know, I don't think that's particular to Emmanuel Episcopal Church in Baltimore. I want right. to go out to Colorado and visit my folks there. Same yeah. thing. Country is war weary. Yeah. So I think the administration understands and sympathizes and shares the hesitation of the American public to get involved in yet another war. But we're doing that in now. In Syria. I have to tell you, I think it's, in a way, it's a little bit of a false dichotomy. Um, there are a lot of things you can do short of sending U.S. military forces into combat, which is why I've always thought it would be much better to arm moderates in the Syrian opposition and give them the tools they need to contain and fight the Islamic State on the one hand, and on the other hand, be able to put enough pressure on the Assad regime that he and or his supporters will say, we have no choice but to negotiate. Are, are we doing government. that now, or by degrading ISIS, are we strengthening Assad? I have to tell you the way the air campaign has been conducted since, what was it, uh, end of September, we've actually disempowered the very moderates that were supposed to be helping and helped Assad substantially. I don't know whether by intent or not, but the way we've done it has been How so? devastating How for so? the moderate opposition. How so? Several things. Number one, um, the moderate opposition is fighting both the regime and the Islamic State in Aleppo, what used to be Syria's largest city. It's up near the Turkish border. We have done all of our bombing, all of our bombing, much farther to the east around Kobani, where Kurds are fighting, uh, an affiliate of a group we've already labeled as a terrorist group in 1997, but that's a separate issue. And then we've bombed down by the Iraq border, a place called Deir Zor, where the Islamic State had the regime surrounded. The bombing around Deir Zor has been effective enough that the Islamic State actually withdrew forces, enabled the regime to reopen supply lines to its forces into Deir Zor, and move air assets that they had been using to bomb the Islamic State, they move those air assets to go bomb the moderates up at Aleppo, which is why you would see articles in the Washington Post saying the bombing campaign against the moderates has actually stepped up since the Americans came in. And it's true, because they no longer had to defend their people at Deir Zor. We were doing it for them. We were Assad's Air Force at Deir Zor. That's the first thing. The second thing is these strikes against uh, this small group called, we call them the Khorasan group, which I have to say has been handled about as badly as I can imagine. First of all, the Khorasan group is a group of bad guys, and we've known about them for a while. But they don't call themselves the Khorasan group, and nobody in Syria calls them the Khorasan group. That was just a moniker that we put on them for the ease of use of Euros government bureaucrats. The people themselves are bad guys. They're definitely terrorists. And they definitely mean to do us harm. But to not warn the moderates, who are literally just down the road from them, that these guys are bad people, and we're going to have to deal with them. I'm not saying give them the date and place of attack. I'm not saying share the, the, you know, the raids are coming in from the north, and they're going to go out. I'm not saying that. But to at least say, these people, for us, are as bad as the Islamic State, and we will treat them the same way as we treat the Islamic State. Give them fair warning 
stay away from them, and you may want to physically get back a little bit because people in the moderate opposition were actually killed in these bombing raids, and they're like, why did you hit these people? They were helping us against Assad. And all we could say is, well, they're the Khorasan group. And they're like, what Khorasan group? There is no such thing as the Khorasan group. So, so what are we accomplishing in this campaign now, in your view? We've held Kobani. Or we've, the U.S. government has helped the Kurds but strategically. Kobani. Strategically? On the Syrian side, nothing so far. I want to ask you about ISIS, ISIL, Islamic State, the threat. Um, I, I, By the way, Frank, just to be fair to the administration, I mean, to be fair, they've had more progress on the Iraq side, but even there, their, their gains are at risk. Yeah, I'll come to that in a moment, and then we'll open up to the questions. But I do want to ask you about this, and I, I quote you because you're just brilliant and articulate and eloquent and all that, Please. but you can but you can say it so succinctly here, and then I get to ask you about it. You said the Syrian conflict has metastasized into something where we're having to do special checks on airplanes coming to the United States. We have jihadis from Florida going and blowing themselves up in Syria. The British have actually interrupted terrorist operations inside Britain emanating out of, emanating out of Syria. You paint a very bleak picture. How big, how bad? Worse now. Now we have kids from Denver, Colorado, my hometown, trying to sign up for jihad in Syria. So how big, how bad? How far-reaching is this Islamic State? Um, a colleague whom I have great respect for, Ryan Crocker, who is our ambassador in Iraq and Afghanistan, a bunch of other places, as tough as they come, Ryan calls the Islamic State Al-Qaeda version 6.0. The reason Ryan calls them that is the Islamic State has more money than any terror group we've ever seen. Um, there are estimates. In of any they, terror group we've ever seen. Right. They earn somewhere between $250,000 and $3 million a day in black market oil sales. That's a lot of money. It's $100 million a month, up to $100 million. Even assume it's a quarter of that. They're still earning $20, $30 million a month. A month. Osama bin Laden never had access to that kind of cash, ever. Um, they own a gigantic piece of territory, um, stretching from Aleppo, close to the Mediterranean, all the way to the Euphrates in Iraq. So it's a lot of space to operate, to train, to recruit. They're really good at social media. Ayman Zawahi and Al-Qaeda, it's kind of boring. He gets on and he kind of rambles, <laughs> sort of like me. Um, the Islamic State, if you get on their websites, go look at Dabit or something. They're like racy videos with music and uh, scenes of you know fighting and tanks going down the streets and I mean, they're quite good. They're I mean, if you liked the movie Patton, you'll love the Islamic State's videos. So um, this is a group we've not dealt with. Before. Nothing like this before. It's both a state. It is a state. I mean, I know the administration hates to call it that, but it is. It operates an administration. It has a a military force with a centralized command. What else would you call that but a state? It operates schools. It operates hospitals. It operates oil fields. It operates tax administration. That isn't a state. Should we just, you, you can't do this. I mean, and we just had the conversation about how war-weary America is. But if they're that dangerous, why don't we just declare war in whatever version we would do that and really go in? Would you support that? Here's the problem, and I know this is what leads the president to hesitate, and I appreciate it. We go in, and we're back to Iraq 2003. We pulled down the Saddam statue, and then what? Well, and then and, what? And, you know, this is all about nation building, and it's not something we're particularly good at. No offense, Amir. Um, we're not particularly good at it, and I don't think the country wants to commit to that again. So again, we go back to the need, Frank, to get the regime and what's left of the state to negotiate with the opposition and let the Syrians figure out how to get that transition unity government, much like they've done with mixed success, but some success in Iraq. Okay, my last question. American qu troops aren't going to make that happen. My last question to you, and then it's just fascinating. We open it up to wherever you all want to go. Two other players with a huge role in a very dynamic and unpredictable moment, Russia and Iran. 
What role are they playing in Syria right now, in your view? And is there a constructive role at all, given, especially with Iran, given some of the rumblings and pressures to actually make progress on the nuclear deal in Rouhani, or is that, forget that, that's not going to happen? Yeah. Uh, the Russians are helping the regime in two ways. One, they're providing a lot of um, hardware. The helicopters that drop these barrel bombs on uh, civilians in Syria and have killed tens of thousands of people. Uh, those are Russian-made helicopters, and they, they send them to Russia for servicing, and then they come back. Uh, the spare parts are Russian. Uh, the pilots are trained uh, by Russians. So uh, they provide that kind of direct military assistance and in large quantities. Uh, and second, they provide political cover, for example, at the United Nations. Um, the Russians were completely unhelpful in the Geneva process. The deal was they would bring the regime to the table to negotiate a transition unity government if we could bring the opposition. I so remember John Kerry's visit to Moscow in June of 20, well, he was brand new Secretary of State. He hadn't been there. It was April 2013, I think. <coughs> Is that right? No, April 2012. You're on your own on this one. Yeah. I can't. <laughs> and, and, and we agreed we would, a new push to get to Geneva. Yeah. It was in, it was not 20, it was 2013. And I remember my Russian counterpart, their Assistant Secretary for Near East Affairs, put his arm around me because we had just said we were going to get the opposition. I was like doing this with Gary, like, no, 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 we don't want to, you know, please don't put that on me. And um, <coughs> Mikhail put his arm around me and said, Robert, you have your work cut out for you. And it took a long time to get the Syrian opposition and the armed opposition, the fighters, to agree to go to Geneva from April 2013 until January 2014. Mm. And that was a long slog, but we did it. The Russians, the regime came, and then when the opposition came into the talks and said, we are willing to negotiate a transition unity government without any preconditions that will have both members of the regime and independence, didn't say opposition, and independence, and we'll negotiate the names with you. We have no precondition that Assad step down. We will even negotiate him. And the regime said, we will not discuss the, anything having to do with the government. And when we went to the Russians. We will not discuss anything having to do with the government. What are you going to talk about? Right. The weather? And, the, and the, the invitation from Ban Ki-moon, which the Russians drafted with us, said specifically, the purpose of the talks is to negotiate a transition unit government as in conform with the Geneva Community. So we went to the Russians. We said, OK, we got the opposition here. They didn't even put a precondition. The UN said, this proposal from the opposition is unbelievable. We, you know, we're shocked. The Russians said, no, we're not going to push it. So, you know, and there's not going to be a veto. I mean, there's not going to be any action in the Security Council, Frank, because the Russians will veto right. it. So I have to say the Russians have been completely unhelpful, completely unhelpful. Iran is even worse. Iran is even worse. How are the Iranians even worse? The Iranians have sent uniformed personnel to go fight in Syria. Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force, group we have identified long ago as a terrorist force. Um, second, they've organized Iraqi Shia militia to go fight. Amir, those very same Jaysh al-Mahdi and Asaib Ath al-Haq people, now they're over in Syria fighting. Some of them. Some of them have gone back to fight the Islamic State in Iraq. When the Iraqi Shia militia started to go home to go fight the Islamic State on their home turf, the Iranians, what did they do? They started organizing Afghans to go fight. So now we have Afghan Hazaras going in to fight in Syria. Um, the Iranians provide all kinds of money. They provide oil, because the regime is flat broke now, has no resources. Uh, the Iranians, even more than the Russians, Frank, are keeping the regime in the game. And so when we think about what to do going forward, I think Iran is an essential piece, because if the Iranians withdraw that support, I don't think the regime's going to last very long. Yeah, but what, what prospect do you give that? <clears throat> you know, the interesting thing is, the Iranians firmly backed Nouri al-Maliki in Iraq. And then when there was, A, a major problem, fall of Mosul and gigantic uprising of Sunnis in general, and the Kurds saying, we've had enough of this, 
and Meliki being so isolated, the Iranians recognize there's a problem with Meliki and maybe this is not such a great idea. When a viable alternative, when a viable alternative, Hyder al came forward, the Iranians quite agilely shifted their support. So the real question is, can one identify some alternatives to the current government? Your questions. Wow, you've given us a lot to chew on here. A lot, a lot to chew on. Go ahead. There's a mic right there, and if I could ask you to stand and give us your name and um, belt your question out, that'd be great. Great. Uh, hi, my name is Jonathan. Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, there you go. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Korn. Uh, thank you for speaking with, with us today. And uh, my, my question was related to a, a comment, really a joke you made earlier in, in the earlier part of your story about how the ambassador doesn't actually do anything useful. My question is, is that really true? Do you make, did you find that you made any you know, important decisions or were you more of a figurehead? And did that change across posts and administrations? There, there absolutely are ambassadors who are no more than figureheads. Um, I think the ambassador is um, the leader of a big team. Uh, the team includes both Americans as well as people from the country, the host country that work for us. Um, in most embassies, most of the staff are not Americans. They're um, in Iraq, they're Iraqis. In Syria, they're Syrians. In Egypt, they're Egyptians. Um, and it's important to, to be a leader for everybody. And when I say leader, I mean two things. Number one, vision. Uh, and number two, anticipating problems and, and getting people to sort of think beyond next week. Um, and then there's a management aspect to it. Um, and there's a sort of a, an analytical element sometimes, not always. Um, if you've been in similar situations and other members of the team have not. Um, so in my case, I think the ambassador is, is essential. But I didn't know that I was supposed to bring the map. <laughs> How much clout did you have back home here? If you picked up the phone and said, I need you to do this, or you should be doing, you know, or, or you wanted to wave a red flag on policy or something, could you? Yeah. Absolutely, I could. Uh, I don't but think even though but your sweatshirt Frank, says Georgetown, but, we're going to Frank. <laughs> Frank, can I just, on, sure, that, sure. on that, it's important to understand, there's a kind of a broad policy framework which the White House and the Secretary set down. Within that broad policy framework, there will be little measures of implementation here and there. That's where you can call home and say, I need some help on this. For example, when we showed our support for human rights of Syrians going to Hama for the, to demonstrate support for their right to protest peacefully. And they sacked our embassy in response three days later. I talked to Bill Burns, who was the deputy secretary at the time. Bill's a great guy. And he said, what can we do to help? And I said, I need you. You're way above me in level. I need you to talk to the Syrians and say, knock it off so that they, the Syrians understand that you've got my back. And Bill did it instantly, called the foreign minister and said, you know, this is outrageous. I would also say one other thing in response to your question. Your going to Hama like that is way more than a figurehead. I mean, that is a very courageous and strong statement for an ambassador to make and has immense impact. So I think that, too, speaks to the, the, the role that, 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 a, that an active yeah, oh, ambassador Yeah, it means have. a lot more than when the vice consul goes. Yeah. Georgetown. Thank you. So Sorry. my name is Amanda, actually. But I think the most interesting lesson that you gave us was not to overuse yeah. media. So when dealing with social media, especially against the Islamic State, would you give the same advice, considering that the State Department has been in direct dialogue with the Islamic State via Twitter, and yeah. the repercussions of this might have caused some of those students or people in Denver, Colorado, to turn the other way? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. And uh, some of the people that are doing that with State Department are colleagues and friends, and, and they're really good. Um, they're not dumb. They're quite, quite, quite smart. So. I hate to second guess them when I'm outside of government and not following it so closely. I guess what I would just say is um, it's important to treat people seriously and not be flip. 
not be flipped. And the, I mean, these are serious issues. And you know, the people that are thinking of signing up to an extremist cause, most of them do it because they themselves are serious. They may be grossly misled, but they're not, they're not um, superficial people. I mean, they have, they're deeply concerned about something, I think. And so I, in order to discuss something seriously with people like that, you have to take them seriously. So that would be what I would say. Um, overuse, hard for me to judge. I'm not quite sure how much they're, they're doing. I don't know, Jim, you may know, but. Let's go here in the middle, and then we'll move to the back and come around. Lots of questions, lots of hands. Yeah, Ken Meyer, Corn Roll Docs. Uh, We're not hearing. Can, can we boost the volume at all of that? Oops, there we go. Okay. That makes it <laughs> Ken Meyer, Corn Roll Docs. Uh, when the president authorized the training of 5,000 Syrian rebels recently, there was some concern that once they were trained, they might switch sides and take their weapons with them. Uh, at the time that he authorized that, we'd already trained 4,000 rebels in camps in Jordan. Uh, do we know what happened to them? Yeah. It might the, be an indication um, of what will happen to the 5,000. You, um, if you check some of the websites that, that cover the Syrian war pretty carefully, um, EA World Vision, for example, Syria Deeply, um, Syria Direct, um, check out what those guys trained in Jordan are doing. They're moving up towards Damascus. Um, they're actually getting pretty close to the outer suburbs of Damascus, so they're doing okay. Um, I don't think we have any apologies to make for that. About the 5,000, I'm going to be real blunt. Um, when I was in Iraq, I worked a lot with Dave Petraeus and his staff. And uh, so one of his staffers that I used to work a lot with is now writing the official U.S. military history of the Iraq war. He's over at uh, National Defense University. So I, I emailed Joel a couple of weeks ago, and I said, uh, how many forces did we have along the Iraq-Syrian border when we were finally able to stop that infiltration from Syria into Iraq? Because a lot of the car bombs when we were in Iraq, a lot of the EFPs targeting our soldiers in places like Ramadi and Fallujah were actually coming out of Syria. So uh, Joel gave me this very detailed. In 2003, we had Brigade X and Brigade Y and Iraqi Division, and I had to send him back an email and say, that's great. Um, how many men, roughly? And uh, he said, we, when we were successful, we never had less than four US brigades and four Iraqi infantry divisions. He said a total of about 20,000 American forces and about 40,000 Iraqi, total of 60. That was his bottom line, total of about 60. I have to tell you, 5,000, uh, you know, the Free Syrian Army uh, isn't going to cut it in terms of stopping movement back and forth. And I notice now the administration has sort of walked that back a bit and said, well, they're actually not going to, like, go into the Islamic State area. They're just going to sort of hold ground where they are. Um, I think that's what the moderates up around Aleppo are already trying to do. So I'm not quite sure what the mission of this group is. It, uh, to me, this is, I, I just don't get it. I, I would love to be able to defend it, but I don't understand what the administration's trying to do. Now. Before we go back, I think there was a question right here. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah. yeah, let's, while you're the mic's right there, and then oh. you're in the back, and we'll go to the back next. Hi, I'm Ricky, I'm a freshman from Elliott School. Um, you know how the Iraqis, the Iraqi army, had a big problem with surrendering and withdrawing before they even engaged mm -hmm. um, the ISIS. Do you think that was uh, a, a problem or a failure of um, American training when they were training the Iraqi army? There are lots of problems with our efforts to train the Iraqis. I don't want to uh, sugarcoat it, but I think there were two main reasons that those units fighting up around Mosul in particular, and then in Salahuddin, uh, ran. Number one, they were almost all from a different part of Iraq. They were almost all Shia soldiers. And they didn't get along with the people in Mosul. People in Mosul didn't like them. Uh, a lot of the checkpoints, there were constant arguments, skirmishes, um, instances where uh, residents of Mosul 
had to pay bribes to get through the checkpoint. Uh, there are instances where the soldiers would detain people um, and hold them for ransom. Um, and not surprisingly, the local population despised them, and the soldiers knew that. Um, and so why would you fight to defend a population that didn't want you there in the first place? Um, and you know, most of the Iraqi soldiers, the conscripts, are not volunteers. I mean, they're volunteers in the sense that they join voluntarily, but they do it as a job, not to defend country. It's a real difference between our volunteer force and theirs. They just, they, they look at the army as kind of like public sector employment. Um, I'm not kidding, That's, it's a real problem. And American training can't change that. Um, and then the second problem was, and this is something that Maliki created, um, and we didn't stop. I'm not sure we could have, but we certainly didn't make much of an effort. Uh, there was terrible corruption at the senior and upper mid-level ranks. Um, and so those soldiers in Mosul, most of them didn't even have water, much less fighting material with which to fight. And so not surprisingly, they left in a hurry. Um, a lot of them, you know, never made it. They got caught and murdered by the Islamic State. So I think uh, just today, I don't know if you follow the news, but the prime minister in Iraq announced a major shuffle in the military command. He fired 26 senior officers, 26 generals. Put in Good start. 18 new commanders. Yeah. Good start. Had to be done. So um, I think a better question you would ask is, were we pressing the previous prime minister and his administration to make those changes or not. In the back, sir. Um, hello, my name is Matthias. I'm a student here at the Elliott School. Can you hear me? OK. Um, I just want to come back to this lesson of go out, go public, reach out, because I would assume that maybe not in every case it's as clear as in Syria that you have you know, the bad government oppressing its population. And I just wanted to ask, how do you figure out whether it's really useful to go out, to reach out, to show presence or if it's maybe in other cases more harmful to your interests so the um, stability of the country to really go out for instance would you have shown up as US ambassador at the prote protests in Turkey uh, in the Gezi Park or in Brazil last year or even in Hungary right now so how yeah. do you figure that out thank you um, as our I students ask really good yeah questions. no no that's a good question so the reason I went was because we expected pretty bad violence, and we weren't sure who was going to start it. We weren't sure if the opposition was going to start it or if the government was going to start it. I mean, the Syrian government has a really bad track record, but on the other hand, when you've got 100,000 people in the streets, you can expect there might be violence coming from the opposition side. So the country has a bad history. That's why I went. Uh, mainly because I expected violence and I wanted to be able to say who started it. Um, what's interesting is the government held back. They didn't send their troops in. They sent their troops in five weeks after I was there, and there was a lot of violence and a lot of people killed. So would I have gone to Gezi Park? Really good question. I think probably not, and I'll tell you why. I don't think the Turkish government is nearly as repressive as the Assad regime. I, don't, I mean, there may have been a few fatalities in the demonstrations in Istanbul, I think there were, but nothing on the scale of what the Syrian government would cause in a single day. And so, in addition, there's a political process in Turkey. It's not perfect, but there is a political process and there are elections that they're not perfect and yet they're broadly representative and legitimate. There's no such thing in Syria. And so the risk of violence is greater, and the need for dialogue between opposition and government was greater in Syria than in Turkey, where there was already a parliament where you could have a real genuine discussion. Maybe Erdogan has the majority, but there's a very vigorous legal opposition. But would you as a, I want to play so, with you. So in, in all of those things, when you put together, an American ambassador going down to Gezi just muddies the water when the Turks have processes themselves that could lead to a resolution. But would you, as the ambassador, in wanting to talk to regular people, want to talk to the organizers and the protesters, maybe not in the square itself, right. but I otherwise? Mean, or would that? Sure. No, you no, would. No. That okay. I would, because right. I think we talk to everybody except terrorists. So, and I assume we've talked to people that were 
involved yeah. in Jesse yeah. Park. Yeah. I'd be kind of angry if we weren't. And the government would not be happy about that. No, but we talked to the government too. In the back, and then we'll come down here. Hi, we're, we're all focused on the Islamic State as a manifestation of Islamic fundamentalism. And we have this notion that it's a recent phenomenon and it's also a main minority of people that kind of have somehow adopted this extremist uh, ideology and subverted Islam. And yet in your story about Algeria, you talked about the uh, civil war in Algeria, which produced as many atrocities, probably as much as the Islamic State, um, you know, goes back to 1991, well before September 11th. And uh, throughout the Arab Spring, every single election that was run resulted in an Islamic majority. So the question is, is this a minority that we're dealing with? And then second, what is feeding it? And in particular, are our uh, supposed allies in the Gulf um, the ones who are feeding it? And should the American government take action on that? Well, I have, I have several things I'd say about that. Um, first, not all political Islamists are extremists. Uh, I think it's really important uh, and maybe more so now than ever, to be able to distinguish between an individual or a group that wants to impose an Islamic state, meaning rule of Sharia, by force versus an individual or a group that wants to establish an Islamic state, have Sharia laws, the essence of legislation, or maybe the totalita uh, totality of legislation, but is willing to participate in a political process and respect the results of the political process, not just the first time, but the second and the third time. Um, I draw a distinction between Abu Bakr Baghdadi, who's, I think, an extreme case, um, and the guy in Tunisia, Rashid Ghanoushi, of the Nahda party. Um, they're both political Islamists, but Ghanoushi is clearly someone who accepts pluralism, uh, who accepts that there's going to be a uh, set of elections, and he might win the first, but he might not win the second, and he has to relinquish power. Um, and in fact, he did relinquish power back in January. Uh, there were just elections in, legislative elections in Tunisia two weeks ago, and a secular party won uh, the second elections. Not to won the first, uh, but the secular party won the second. So I don't think this is an inevitable wave. Um, Tunisia has its own specific sort of uh, situations, middle class and heavy European influence. Um, but I don't see that political Islam is, is the only possible future for the region, but I think political Islam is important because it touches a chord. It's authentic to a lot of people, and the secular uh, parties have done a really lousy job, in many cases, explaining a vision. Many times they contradict each other. Um, this is a true story. Amir, you were there. You will remember this. Um, so the first time we do elections in Iraq, uh, free elections, we're going to have the UN running it. This is in January 2005. The Shia Islamists all gathered together on one single list with one common platform. The secular parties, none of them formed coalitions. Because it was a wide open election, there were something like 110 secular parties competing. The ballot was like bigger than that. And you had to find which one of these 110 parties was the one you wanted. I, I mean, it was just ridiculous. So I, I'm not saying I support political Islam. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that. It's not enough to complain that Gulf states are creating this problem. Um, in some cases, there are financial flows that are helping <coughs> Islamic parties. That's, that's absolutely true. But you know, the people who have a non-religious vision need themselves to clean up their acts. They need to stop insisting that everyone wants to be the chief. They need to work together, whether that be in Iraq or in Syria or in Jordan, or in Egypt, or in Algeria, or in Morocco. We uh, have, 
and and uh, think more broadly about how to how to rally support for a broad vision. We have to get you to a train, so we have yeah. time for one more, and we'll go to this lady in the back. Sorry. Ambassador, if you can answer your question, so what is the alternative to Assad at the moment, and what are the steps forward to get to a point where you can convince Iran, Russia, and et cetera, or maybe create a situation where the opposition can find a leadership to eventually you know, uh, replace Assad, et cetera? Uh, the way forward now is really, 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 really hard. I, it's harder now than it was a year ago. Uh, that's how much worse things are. I think, I think we have to work on two levels. One, and maybe we have to do this part first, we have to get Iran and Russia to agree that there really has to be a negotiation about a transition to unity government. If they won't agree to that, there really is nothing that can be done. And very frankly, what's going to happen is it's going to be extremist versus Assad. Good luck picking on that. Talk about Hobbesian choice. Um, if the Russians and the Iranians really want to push it to that degree, there really isn't anything we can do to stop them. Um, but if they are willing to say, no, no, we really do need to get to a negotiated deal here, um, then I think we're going to have to agree with, with them on some fairly specific principles. I hesitate to name names. Our experience, the Americans, we never picked a good name in Iraq. We always got it wrong. <laughs> um, we had a 1,000 batting average, or a zero, I guess I should say. So I wouldn't want to, and I don't think the Iranians and the Russians would necessarily do any better. Uh, so then the question is how to get a negotiation between Syrians going so they can pick it out. And I think probably what that means is Russia and Iran are going to have to say to the Assad regime, no, no, this time you really are going to have to negotiate. Maybe it doesn't have to be in Geneva. It can be in Moscow. It can be in Tehran. I don't care. Where the people that go are able to negotiate, and there is no retaliation in Syria for people whose names are discussed. Today, the regime arrested a guy named Louis Hussein, uh, who is an ally, He's, you know, from the community that supports Assad the most. Uh, Louis has been on public saying the regime is falling apart and it needs to negotiate a transition government. When he came back into Syria today, he was arrested. That tells me the Assad regime is pretty brittle. Um, we need to let you go, but before we do that, I'm going to ask something that you should never ask of a diplomat, mm. which is a highly speculative question. Mm. We never speculate. No. Your phone rings. Uh huh. On the other end of the phone is Hillary Rodham Clinton. Mm -hmm. She says, Robert, mm -hmm. I've been meaning to call you. Mm -hmm. If I run for president, <laughs> what is the headline from this part of the world likely to be a year from now? And if I am elected, what should I do about it? <laughs> the headline from that part of the world will be Islamic State Fights On in Syria and Iraq. A year from now. A year from now. And what to do about it is to find ways to build national unity governments in Iraq and Syria with regional support that will rally majorities of the population in both countries to confront the Islamic State. And she says, Robert, that was such a thoughtful response. Would you come work for me? Would you go back to the region? You would say. I'd say, Madam Secretary, the Orioles' opening game is <laughs> April 1st. And, uh, you know, we're going to win it all this year. Ambassador, <laughs> Ambassador Ford, I, I, I want to say how grateful we are for your incredible insight and, and your remarkable candor, because we've done this a lot, and we don't often hear this kind of inside st storytelling and, and, and honesty. I promise you that, that Walter, if he had been here, would have been thrilled with this conversation. So it was my pleasure. Thank you for being here, and thank Can you for Can I just say something to students? Please. I hope those of you who are thinking about the State Department or USAID, or the CIA, or military, will we'll think about public service. I think public service is really important. Um, I, I have met 
people from college who are working in business in New York and California and all that. And I, I don't mean to belittle them. I, they have entirely satisfying careers and lives. But there is something very special about getting up in the morning and saying, I'm working for the interests of my whole country. Um, I have to say that is something I miss. And so for those of you who are thinking about government service, I'm, it's not always easy to get in. Um, but don't rule it out. And for all, the, for all the paralysis and for all the everything yeah, else, yeah. it's oh, still it's worth got, it. It's still I, worth it. I mean, it. it has a zillion aggravations. Um, and they still don't tell you the red wine glass goes to the right <laughs> and the sparkling <laughs> wine goes in the middle. So. No whining. Yeah. Ambassador, thank you very much. Thank we appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank.